Thank you all very much for taking the time. It's um, I'm I'm really I'm a tad overwhelmed. I must say, um, it's a remarkable project. I'm I'm particularly interested in the perspective that Jerry and Priscilla provided you, Tom, as the director. I'm I'm really interested in knowing what what those conversations, maybe those early conversations, were like between the three of you. What kind of questions did you ask? Um, from the very beginning, I thought that the dialogue I would have with Jerry and Priscilla was important. And early on, we talked about the music being the focus. And I spent a lot of time with them and, and would sit in the cutting room and their voices guided this film. This mm -hmm. Getting that sort of uh, time with Priscilla where I was focusing on the details of her understanding Elvis the artist was key. Yeah. And yeah. right away, um, I knew when I came back from uh, the first interview, I knew right away that there was something different in this. And, and both Jerry and Priscilla were presenting story details that I was chasing after that were lost in the Elvis story. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things um, about his history and development, the relationship with the colonel, the details of the music, all that came out in these conversations. And because it was audio only, I think we got to know each other and spent a lot of time and, and didn't have a crew sitting around looking at us while while we discussed these things. Priscilla, what 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 did you want people to know that perhaps, you know, has gotten lost in, for lack of a better term, the myth that he became? Just what it portrayed. Tom you did an amazing job with this. And truly, truly, I mean so much. Two, what, how many years? Two years? Two years talking with Jerry, talking with myself, and, and I think what came out of it for both Jerry and I, and I know with Tom, is to show how much of an artist Elvis Presley was, that p people I don't feel ever got him as an artist. His own management didn't get him. His label didn't get him. You know, um, they saw that he was a commodity, and I think he was, not I think, you know, he realized that toward the end, that he was just a commodity, that he would never really be able to reach the heights that he wanted in film, and even in, in, in his music. I mean, the music that he gravitated to is really what you saw here. And from and what gets me, it's which is so personal for me, and Jerry and I have talked about this, for a long time, is here he was 10 years old, which is very revealing, 10 years old singing Old Shep. And this is a, a, a what, 10 year old sings a song of loss and pain and, and being in touch with a, a dog. So people missed it. They just missed who he was. And, and I get quite emotional every time uh, I see this this film, and it's already been like 15 times already, and I still get enough. <laughs> I still I keep thinking, okay, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to walk up, and I'm going to just be strong, and and you know, be able to talk. But it's it's hard. It's really hard. It's just like li relive it, and and uh, it, the most. So that's really it's really about showing the artist and who he was, and he was so much deeper deeper than those movies. And and I can't really kind of put the movies down that much because there are people who love the movies. So I I, uh, I just know what his where his heart was, what he wanted to do, as, as you do as well, Jerry. And um, th to have his career veer off in a whole other direction because there was a there was pain there, there was loss there. And uh, and this the, the documentary is asking uh, answering so many questions that people have asked about Colonel Parker. Why not go overseas? What was the big deal? Why couldn't Colonel go? So I hope, and in talking with Tom, and he got it that you get the answers that you always wanted to know as an audience. Yeah, you, you know the, the the specter of Colonel Parker se seems to you know kind of weigh over not only his career but the you know the the, the film in particular. Um, did he ever talk to you about about the colonel? What did, what did he what did what might he have said to you in an unguarded moment? Well, I, I won't I won't repeat those. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, Scott, and this was a difficult thing for Priscilla and I because uh, he's an easy to go to bad guy, mm. you know. And I had, we had creative disappointments or disagreements with the colonel. But 
You know, the colonel, from his own perspective, I mean, the colonel, it wasn't all about money. It looks that way if you don't know him, but he, when you say Priscilla, he loved Elvis. He and did love Elvis. He did love Elvis. I can't say that he did anything evil to hurt him. He that, just, yeah. like, it's just like I said, he just didn't know his artist. He did what he did, promoted. Hmm. And, and, and I think the love went both ways. It's like Priscilla says in the narration, uh, Elvis creatively outgrew the colonel, and we saw that. I, very, and the beauty of Tom's directing was Tom came into this project not as a producer who knew everything. He listened and he learned. And ironically, Priscilla and I've learned from the film that Tom's produced. We sit there and we're bad. I hope we didn't distract him, but we should. Why did, where did this come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's one thing. You had, you know, complete access to the archive and to, um, I believe, everything that RCA had. Um, th th this is an enormous undertaking. I, I wouldn't have the film today this way without Priscilla and Jerry opening up the vault at Graceland and, mm. and spending days. And, and, and Vernon saved everything. So all the images of the stationery and the letters and the original contracts, all those details I got from Graceland. And they really, what I think happened also in those visits with the research was I started to realize that Graceland itself was a character. Mm. So then you start to look at the space. And because they gave me this access that was after hours, I started to walk around Graceland and feel the presence of it being a home and took that back to New York and, and started to think, you know, this is going to play as a character. We can go much bigger. And the archival footage, I tapped into collectors. And, and I was really lucky because having access to the contact sheets, I was able to present an Elvis Presley that stripped down those iconic photos of him uh, from the movie stills or a concert photo. Uh, it, having so many, I had over 8,000 photographs and thousands of hours of footage. And we just pour over it obsessively to try to find that tone. And we, we found things that, you know, a Super 8 that was never seen in concert footage. And how about Gladys's voice singing? Yeah, that's the huge I had huge I had thing. never, ever heard that. I had never oh, so, even so heard you, it So you were not aware, well, no, aware of that? No, I didn't. I did wow. not know. How did you find that? Um, er, Ernst Jurgensen uh, is an archivist that works with the uh, Sony Legacy called me up, someone had it on a tape, reel to reel, and I played it, and I had it for months, and I was obsessed with it, but I couldn't figure out where to put it in the film. And then one day I realized that it's this haunted sound, it has this reverb, and then I realized it doesn't belong in film one, it belongs in film two, and, 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 and it, it, I just played around with it until it, it found its place. I couldn't give up on Gladys singing, just the yeah. idea of it. And, and that's how I approach these films. I really believe that the sound and, and these moments of archive and stills are driving the story and you gotta follow it. You know, there, there, there was one documentary done on him during, during his lifetime. And, and I'm wondering if any of that helped inform some, some, of, some of this. Um, I, I, the, the, the person is Andrew Salt, I believe, and he's a mm -hmm. producer on the film. Mm -hmm. And um, it's This Is Elvis, that's what yeah. I think you're referencing. Yeah. It, for me, in, in those early days, I remember seeing that film. Um, I think, I think I was taking a lot more from the conversations with Jerry and Priscilla, and um, really working off of that energy, mm -hmm. and then also going deep into the catalog. Those those were the driving forces for me to to both sculpt the narrative and 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 stumble upon some beauty. Yeah, Priscilla, you um, you you've talked previously about. Um, kind of opening up in this film um, and, and with Tom uh, in, in a way that you've not done before about um, Elvis and, and, and his career and his artistic um, ambitions. Why now? Well, I think it has to be told because I'm afraid that if we didn't tell the story, someone else would tell the story and get it all wrong. Mm. And if we didn't, while well, we're still here, we've lost a few people in, in our... Pack, uh, Memphis Mafia, quite a, actually quite a few, actually 56 people. 
And uh, that was a realization for me when I started, after we had lost Joe Esposito, and that was like the trigger for me to go, oh my God, if we don't do this, as if, the, if this doesn't happen, it will be distorted out of you know out of proportion in in one way or another other people's perspective hearsay altered so the opportunity came and we grabbed it and uh, Cherry and I talked about it I said if you know I know for myself that's all I've been thinking about is how the social media is today all the fake news I can't imagine anybody else doing this and this is you know this is a very very honest honest documentary. It humanizes Elvis Presley. That was the other fear that I had, was that, you know, the fans, uh, you know, see his their idol and l love him and have followed him and supported him and their children and grandchildren uh, are supporting him. That my fear was um, they see their idol a certain way and now will this be, will this humanize Elvis too much where they, they don't want to see that. They want to see Elvis the way they want to see him. And that was, uh, that was a fear that I had, mm. hoping that they could see his vulnerability, seeing the man behind the music, seeing his dreams, and, and embracing him even more. Because my whole thing is that if you love him now, I think you love him even more. You know, when you see his vulnerability and how he was so, he was so authentic, Elvis was. He didn't put any, any, uh, anything up to, you know, to, what do you call it, a facade. What you saw here is what you got. I, I mean, to, to, you know, to my mind, this, this really elevates him, you know, in a way that hasn't been done previously. Well, Scott, that was our original motivation. Um, uh, the iconic image is a wonderful thing in a certain way, but we felt that the human uh, was being lost in that iconic image. And there was a sensibility for Elvis's intelligent. You know, he just wasn't a lucky, as we say in the film. He worked hard. And, you know, we, we took, I think it was the second meeting at HBO, uh, Andrew and I had put together, and Priscilla, a little reel of Elvis uh, outtakes in the documentaries where you see he's the most, when you guys say, underrated producer in music history. He was the producer, mm -hmm. you know? So we really wanted to get that across. And just to, just to say, uh, uh, Carrie, are you still here, Anthalus? Yeah. Okay, Carrie, okay. of course, who <laughs> is the force behind this for HBO, uh, saw that footage exactly. and took out that, just what Jerry said, Elvis as a, prov a producer. You know, Tom also did Bruce Springsteen's uh, documentary, which is also a big selling point for us to see what he did with Bruce. And so this is our guy. And of course, Carrie uh, is the one who suggested um, Tom. But... Uh, Carrie, you know, you hit it right on the nail as seeing yeah. that, like I said earlier, no one ever saw him as the artist. No one ever mentioned that before about Elvis produced, you know, when was behind the scene at, at mm -hmm. his, on his music. So that, again, is all a, re a revelation. And Priscilla you know. and I did all that time. We didn't know Tom, Tom, <laughs> who Tom was. <laughs> and, uh, and Carrie was not just HBO. He was a creative producer in this. And thank, thank you, Carrie, because... Yeah. We, I don't think we could have done this story mm -mm. with anybody as sensitive and talented no. as Tom Zimmer. No. Hmm. Uh, the idea of no talking heads, you know, because when you have talking heads and it happened to me, many times when I watch a documentary, I get caught up in the talking head and I forget about all what's going on. And I, you were right on track. You, you, as we're talking, you can see it. And, uh, and that was brilliant. Yeah, you never, you, you never get drawn away from the story. You're always in the story. I I came into this as an editor, and and then in cutting documentaries that way, um, I just recall that feeling of wanting to stay in the space of the film. And when Priscilla sent the home movies to me, I I really felt like, what would it be like if we could just tap into the Elvis dream from the very beginning, first frame, and you stay in that? And the dream for me would be archival footage, stills, and 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 at these atmospherics of these characters in Elvis's life. And at the point, at that early, in those early stages, I wasn't even sure. 
but I just knew that I would step, I would take you out of the dream if I, I if I cut to someone talking in a chair. Mm. And um, it was terrifying the very beginning days. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because you're so psychologically used to in the cutting room having this timeline that has picture and sound, and then all of a sudden it was just sound and nothing. So it's, it was a great challenge as a director, and also I, I got to really pay attention to the musical quality and, and the rhythm of Jerry and Priscilla. And that was a, a driving force in the editing. Hmm. You know, um, it, it, watching this the first time was so revealing. And I, and seeing it in sync as far as his life and what happened, seeing him, and, and that was new for me too, seeing it as a whole, wow, was so, so emotional and a learning experience on his life, even though I feel I know it, it was an eye-opener because how fun, free-giving he was, how, how raw, how, 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 um, how, like we say, he was so stylish, he, he had everything, he just created the culture of rock and roll in every way, the style, the look, the feel, and when you see it in a documentary like this, you go, wow, what a huge impact and he was so carefree he was so loving he was so happy and then when he goes into the army when you visual when you're visually seeing it you go oh my god he changed so much i mean losing his mother going right into the army he was lost and you can see it and what an impact that made for myself the first time i saw it when you actually see it and, and you realize he never was the same after he lost his mother. Not that free loving spirit that you see before. When I met him in Germany, I saw that very lonely spirit, that one who was grieving, that one who never had time to grieve for his mother because he went straight on that ship to Germany. And that was so emotional and still is to me because I got to hear all about it. But now when I see it visually, it's, it's just right in your face, and that was that's really hard to watch. Mm. Um, you know, one one of the things that I think this brings out, uh, you know, m more so than any other discussion about his career, is his commitment to musicianship, which does not get discussed at all, and particularly that affinity for African American gospel music, soul music, the R and B, blues. It, it, this was really important in our early discussions, mm. one of the misunderstandings about Elvis and, and, and his world was a lot of times I've seen or I've read just different things that sort of check off a box, gospel, Elvis, like gospel. There's no exploration of black gospel, white mm. gospel. Um, I've worked with Bruce and John Landau for a long time and I was fortunate enough to get into conversations with them about gospel and different influences. So I had a sense of it but one of the key things was sitting with Jerry and, and Priscilla and getting the, the stories about Memphis. Mm -hmm. And then sitting with David Porter. David right. Porter was a key voice for me in, yes. this, in painting a picture of Memphis at the time. And I also have to say, um, Tom Petty um, was an enormous, um, uh, uh, gave the film such soul. And it could talk about Elvis the musician and the artist. And I'm enormously grateful for the time. I didn't know him, but I had a, a bit of time with him, and he just brought so much to those elements that recognize Elvis, the musician, who had those influences with race mm. and culture. And that's what we needed. You know, Jerry and I were the youngest in 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 our group. Um, he's actually older still than me, are. but I, 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 I'm still the youngest. Thank you. <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> But having Bruce Springsteen, David Porter, and Tom Petty as artists to get you to see what an artist's point of view is, is what Elvis did not have with all of us. We were all so young. We, here we were living with Elvis, being around him, but, and we knew he was Elvis Presley, but not as the artist. We did not have uh, advice for him. We did not, I mean, he would never ask us anyway, but if we did, <laughs> we, we, we didn't have words like, like Bruce and Tom do to make you understand an artist to an artist, which I thought was brilliant to have instead of the same old people, not us, the same old people, talk and talk and talk. Well, you know, and only an artist, you know, 
I love what Bruce says is that, you know, uh, uh, when he's on stage, he says home. And right. when he gets home yeah. is when he's pretending. And we yes, all in rock that, and roll know that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah do we yeah. ever? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but that is true. That is true. He felt more comfortable. He loved what he was doing on stage. And when he would come home, it would only be for so long, and then he was antsy, he was ready to go again. Yeah. And that's an artist's life, and you have to understand that. And, for a and, woman, rock and roll is not the life, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> And you know what, what? What Tom Petty says very early in the film: there was no roadmap. He had no, no template, no one to follow, no one to, you know, emulate in in any way, or even get feedback on right, wrong, or indifferent. Yes, but I think what? that's. I think. Go ahead. One second, let me get brief. That's where Colonel Parker came in, mm. because Colonel Parker seemed to know everything. Colonel, like he said mm. in, the, in there, what was you know, what is Colonel Parker to you? Blah blah blah. Everything. So mm. he depended on Colonel Parker because, like you said again, Sam Phillips couldn't do it for him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th there's a thing I really re relate to that Tom says. I've never told you guys this, but when he says, "Imagine watching this." and not being prepared, which I got to do when I was 13 years old. Mm. Uh, and that was the beauty of Elvis. You know, there was a lot of influences on rock and roll, but he really, he kicked the door in. Yeah, you know. yeah. Um, uh, you know, and, and spinning off the, the musicianship um, and that tension that, you know, he eventually obviously started to feel as he's doing more of these films and getting further away from from the music and from what what he loved, um, it, hard for you to to see that again to to kind of feel that tension again. You know, I think uh, Priscilla's hinted on this too. If we only knew today, what uh, you know, what we know today back then. Uh, we didn't have that much influence business-wise. I mean, he'll ask about a certain song or whatever, but, you know, we didn't have any of that kind of influence. And, you know, I, I think when I say that he... Sam Phillips was not a national guy, but with there is no place in the world that Elvis Presley could have walked into. It took him a year to walk in there. <laughs> and get a record deal. Without the genius of Sam Phillips, this certainly wouldn't have happened as soon as right, it did. Right. Or it would be a much different uh, story. It would be a different yeah. story. Yeah. You know, I have to say one thing. Elvis, I, I'm really good friends with Dixie Locke, who, um, who uh, uh, dated Elvis. She was his first girlfriend, really, first real girlfriend. And she said to me, you know, that Elvis told her that he, he knew that he was unique, and he knew that he was going to be something one day. Hmm. And I thought that was really revealing because he mentioned not in the same words, the same with me. I knew, I knew something big was going to happen. Yeah. What, uh, what was it about? What did you sense about him that you knew something special was going to happen? Uh, first of all, I, Elvis Presley was a force. I mean, you could feel his presence come into a room. Even if he wasn't around and he was close by, you felt that there was an energy. I mean, he was, he'd walk into a room and you, you didn't know what hit you. You'd go, whoa, and it was electric. Hmm. And I have never met anyone to this day, and I don't care how famous they are, that had that same electricity. Yeah. I, I have to touch on, on, on one thing. Uh, Mike McCready was supposed to join us. Unfortunately, right. he's, he's a little under the weather. But I do want to touch on, on, the, on the original score um, because it so beautifully bridges um, uh, kind of, you know, the, the emotions. I, I feel like Mike did a tremendous job. And what a, what a difficult task to be against the music of Elvis Presley. Right. And he was so um, generous and... I'm not a musician, and I would go to uh, his studio in Seattle and talk about ideas and, 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 and talk about the sounds uh, that I would hear in this. So when we're talking about the Louisiana Hayride, I'm saying it's sort of like that Johnny Cash thing pared down, but we don't want to sound like we're riffing too much on that. Mm. And I would talk to him in those terms, and Mike got into the film 
and he stepped into the Elvis dream and it influenced the cutting so much because um, at one point he called me up and he said, I, I've got this idea for a harp and, and a girl singing way in the background high. I didn't know what he was talking about. He sent it to me and I realized quickly that was Graceland. That's how mm -hmm. I saw Graceland. So he was driving a lot of times uh, the narrative with me with these emotional land, sonic landscapes that, that he would send. And, and it wasn't, it, he scored to picture, but there were other times where he, he just would turn in something after a long conversation. And I totally, I, I, I learned that sort of dialogue watching um, Bruce and John and, yeah. and that way of getting across the idea. Yeah. And Mike, Mike, Mike reminds me of that energy. So as um, um, as the pro how long was the project beginning? To it was end? three years of um, talking, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, between Sony and HBO, and and figuring out the, the the beauty of film and rights and things like that, and then a year to make it. Hmm. But we had been talking for a few years. Yeah. And, and, and was that dialogue ongoing even as you were into production? They were with me every step, mm -hmm. and I would check in with Priscilla and talk about um, sometimes something that's not a direct reference to the scene. It wasn't calling up to say, you know, what about this part of the movie? Yeah. I was getting, uh, outside the interviews, I was getting this tone and this understanding, and I would take that back to the cutting room, and, and mm. it's in the film. And, and to clarify earlier, I didn't want Tom, it was because he was in New York, and Priscilla and the rest of us were out here, but Tom would fly back with rough cuts. We mm. were on the phone, it, and we spent a lot of time together, so, mm. you know. How long did it take to kind of determine a through line? Because, you know, again, I'm thinking about the enormity of this. You, you know, I always felt like um, there was something in the 68 special footage, mm -hmm. and, I, and I knew I was telling the story of Elvis's life, but I knew I didn't want a, a, a nonlinear, uh, this linear approach. I wanted a nonlinear approach. So after one of the early cuts, um, I immediately start putting the 68 special in, and that way you get into the cutting room and you stumble on these moments, and, and it, I don't know the time. It's a little bit of a blur. Yeah, um, yeah. But, uh, you do find these moments in the cutting room, then you you just follow it and you mm -hmm. chase it. And mm -hmm. the 68 special for me, every time I looked at the 68 special, it, it reminded me of the themes we talked about because there's Elvis the musician. And I kept going back to it. He's playing the guitar, he's, he's looking at the guys, there's his history, there's that beauty. So I knew that that was going to be a thread throughout the film, I just tried not to be too conscious about how I would do it. I was just going to chase it. Mm. So fair warning, I'm going to ask for a couple questions from the house in, in, in a minute. When the film was, was completed and, and the first time that, that you got to see it, were you surprised? Were you surprised at, at I, I know for me watching it, and granted I wasn't involved in making it, it was overwhelming. It's, it's, a, it's, uh, to you know, consider kind of the myth, and then and then get a much better perspective. And I'm wondering if you guys felt that as well. Yeah, I you know, let's go ahead, Priscilla, because I was going to talk about us watching that. Yeah, you, no, you it was start. so it was so overwhelming, a hard, very very difficult. Like I said earlier, to see it all in sequence, see it all done after our interviews, what was taking out of it, hearing Bruce, hearing Tom, hearing. David Porter, who was a gift for us because, like you said, gave us the whole sense. And Ellis described to me, you know, when I was quite young, again, uh, not knowing what to expect of Graceland, what to expect of Beale Street, what to expect when he talked to me about Beale Street, about the music, about, he. I mean, he would always show everybody all the places that he went to and, they're, you know, all, all the, the music, the history of it, and the color and the liveliness, and then seeing it on the screen, I, I went, oh my God, this is, I felt like I was there. Hmm. It just, the whole sense put you there. And then of course, taking the journey. And it, it was hard, you know, I, it was very, very emotional. Hmm. Very emotional watching it, being involved with it, even knowing and having the conversations. But when you put it in perspective and see it on film, it's, um, it's big, it is overwhelming. Yeah. 
And thank God you're finally comfortable. I sit with her for so many screenings, <laughs> and she's like, oh, my God. I mean, are, am I giving too much away? Is it? And I'm saying, no, this is what need. And I saw, I'm not going to quote it, but I saw it, an email recently that she's finally, <laughs> I'd love to say, you but say I can say it. So in the film, uh, there is a part where Elvis, the colonel, says a Christmas song, and, uh, you know, Elvis bows down, supposedly. Elvis, we know, never bow, bowed down to the colonel. The colonel knew where the strength was. And they walk outside. He walks out with Steve Bender, and he says, Fuck him. pardon my language. <laughs> I'm quoting from the film. So through all of these screenings and everything, I think the email was to Carrie. And it was a beautiful email from Priscilla to Carrie, that was, we were CC'd on, on, and she mentioned all the insecurities and all of this stuff, and she said, and at this point, if they don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> so we, we, we got time for, for one or two questions here. Yes, sir, right here. Yes, that is true. And Jerry lived it. I lived it. He was a nervous wreck. Remember, he hadn't been singing live for nearly 10 years. He had hmm. only been doing movies. He hadn't done anything live. So you have to remember, again, going, not doing this. Here comes, he, you know, he's a solo artist, but the British invasion came. He was the, one of the only solo artists. Now he's going to do a TV sp a special. He's finishing up his movie career or his movie contract. And yes, he was nervous because, like I said, it's going to make him or break him. This is his career. And we left him alone. I mean, he didn't, he paced back and forth, and, and Steve's story it, it was that way. Um, he didn't want to come out. He was a nervous wreck. And people ask me, are, are, are fascinated that Elvis Presley got nervous. It's like he said, it's hard to separate the image from the human. He's a human being. And that image, that king of rock and roll, that, you know, that he's, he's strong and this and that, no. He was, he was nervous and he could be sometimes like a little boy, you know, and, and uh, all those uh, myths that you're talking mm, about yeah. is broken down here. Yeah. Who else? Yes, right here. Hi. Um, a couple of things. Did Tom Petty see any of this before he died? Hmm. I don't know. I, I had finished the film and, and it was mixed and everything was done and um, I, I don't know. Okay. Second, um, I've seen almost every documentary about Elvis and I, I cannot get over this. It's the second time I've seen it and I just love this documentary. It is, it is, it is um, changing. It will change how people see Elvis. That's the point. That is really the point, and I think he did an amazing job doing that. I mean, I can't imagine the pressure that you were under. I can't imagine the sleepless nights. I can't imagine you not being in the hospital. Of course, I know you were. <laughs> huh. Somebody waving frantically in the back there, yes. Was it was there, I, I guess I guess the question is was 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 there was there any you know potential for Elvis to get out from under Colonel Parker? I will. Uh, it's a tough one, but uh, I will answer it and and I'll do it from Elvis's point of view. Uh, 1974. First of all, Elvis had opened up and asked me to open up his own production company. People say, what would Elvis be doing today? Of course, he'd be singing. But he was kind of that Clint Eastwood, Barbara Streisand. I used to go to the dailies with him. He had that touch. He was so smart. And opened up a production company to do a karate documentary. You remember that? And uh, was going to do another film. 
The colonel did not like that at all. The reason Elvis bought the Lisa Marie jet was he was preparing to tour overseas. The reason we went to the White House to get a badge, because it was that badge was covered over. I mean, he was planning. It was a, he never was one to say, here's what I'm going to do. But you just followed his, his patterns and hmm. stuff. And, hmm. um, you know, uh, but finally one night, I think it was 74, uh, he just had enough. And he said, get the old man up here. Uh, and uh, Colonel was upset, it was like three in the morning, but don't forget we're doing two sh late shows. And he said, Colonel, uh, I want to do the films. I want to go overseas. And he, Colonel said, if you go, you'll go without me. And Elvis said, okay, you're fired. And he fired the Colonel. And it just wasn't for the moment. I ran the papers at the Hilton Hotel from the fourth floor to the 30th floor about how much money Elvis would owe the Colonel. You know, that's how Colonel did business. Um, so few, couple of weeks later or whatever, Elvis gets in touch with the promoter through one of the guys to book a tour. And the promoter's like, I can't do it. The Colonel hired me. And that went for everything, for hmm. movies and everything. Hmm. The business is much more sophisticated now. But Elvis did try. And Elvis did throw scripts against the wall. And he did have a temper, right, Priscilla? Uh, but he was an island. On, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. You know. yeah. We got time for one or two more. Yes, right here. Uh, just, the film works so well. Your granddaughter was great in Paterno? Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, she was amazing. And I'm wondering, did any of you guys ever have to ask him what the words were? Because, you know, growing up with the songs, uh, oftentimes it was like you want to sing along with them, but then you just go, <laughs> <laughs> Well, now you can read them and, and sing them and know them. <laughs> one more. Got time for one more. Right here. Yeah, I, um, it's an honor, first of all, as a huge Elvis fan, it's an honor to speak with you. My name's Nick. Um, just wanted to say there are a lot of pop stars who have come and gone over the years. Was there a moment, or uh, Priscilla or Jerry, where you knew that this was an icon who was going to be there with Mozart, Bach? For, for, I mean, with all serious, but for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah, when, when, he, when he ascended beyond just, you know, being a music star. Yes. Uh, what is the question? Um, um, was, was there a moment when you, you kind of knew the, 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 a tipping point, if you well, will? Well, let me just say right now, uh, right now in present time, we're, um, we're, we're doing Elvis. We did the Elvis with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh, if I, I mean, I can't, uh, if I can dream, number one, went triple platinum. And The Wonder of You went triple platinum again last year. So we're doing, Jerry did Australia. I did Europe. I did tw twice. Uh, uh, England, I just came back from Argentina. 12,000 people showed up, 5,000 people showed up in Chile. And at the O2, uh, 12,000 people. And I said to them, my God, I never in my life, you know, ever, I, I, I know a lot of people, but to, uh, for uh, someone to fill up an arena, 12,000 people, 40 years after their passing, I don't know who else can do mm. that but Elvis Presley. <laughs> Right. And he's doing it. Well, that is... He's knocking him out. Sell out, sell out, sell out. Hmm. And I was shocked in Argentina. They were... I mean, he's never appeared there. Never seen anything there as far as entertainment. And they were going crazy. You know in the soccer games where they go, oh, oh, oh like that? Do you know... Are you soccer fans, anyone? Okay. But you know what I mean, right? When the whole, the whole benches are... Well, this is what was happening. They didn't want the show to end. And they were all with their lights going, oh, hmm. Like I like got a soccer team, and it was you get again so emotional. Twelve, I, I mean, twelve thousand people. Amazing, amazing. It is amazing. Well, she just got back yesterday, by the huh. way. She's here today. Well. <laughs> um, 
that may be that may be a fitting button to put on on uh, on this discussion and, and this afternoon. I can't thank you all enough for taking the time to come to bring the film and to share your your thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. Jerry Schilling, Tom Zimney, and Silver Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, guys. Thank you.